Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Welcome to Rural Heritage. Today we spend some time with our friend Ralph Rice. Ralph will talk about his farm plan and his methods for small-scale diversified family farming. You know, we had a vision when we came here. We, we used to live on the east end of the farm in a two-story farmhouse uh, with a big barn, but it didn't take long to realize that the barn was old style, so it required a lot of hand labor, as well as the laundry was in the basement and the closets and everything were upstairs, so it was a lot harder for my wife to, um, to do her chores. So we decided to move here and get on one floor, and that allowed me to set up the farm better and all on, there's a lot of buildings here, but each one has a purpose. and. The other purpose was I didn't want to borrow a bunch of money at my midlife. So we built the buildings as we could afford them. A lot of the lumber came off the farm and we just slowly added to them. There is some merit to moving in a place and building a giant shop or a great big barn, but again, I just didn't want the debt. So we built as we could afford it. And that being said, it's very deliberate. Uh, 20 years ago, I wrote a plan on graph paper and sketched out the buildings and the driveways to make sure I could make the turns with the horses and equipment. Um, and each building then at that time had a purpose right down to the bins for the spelt and the hog stuff. But the other concern is we live on a very busy road and I didn't want to be out on the road with farm equipment, especially the horses. We're slower and, and it just causes a whole set of problems that people here aren't used to. At the time there were no local Amish around where people were on the, they see a slow moving vehicle, they think you're moving 25 miles an hour, not four. So that being said, we put a central lane in and divided the farm up into paddocks. So the central lane allows me to go to any one of the paddocks at any time and keeps us off the road. It also makes moving livestock very easy and we rotate pastures often and so, uh, the central lane, they all get used to it. There's times when, if I have a wild bunch of sheep, for instance, I can just open the gate and let them get in the lane, then walk out the next day, close that gate, open up the next gate. So they kind of move themselves. You know, currently, most everything comes when I bang on a bucket, everything comes when I call it. Um, so it's a non-issue, but if something gets out, you have an awful lot of time, gates you can shut to contain it. They're not really out. They may not be where you want them, but they're not out even the front gate out uh, in the drive out front. <clears throat> um, so that helps a ton. It also makes it easy for the horses when I'm coming and going. It just, um, I just su I suggest it. The water lines, the fences, everything works for that. And again, it was no accident. We kind of laid it out so that, uh, but most of the paddocks are three to five acres. So uh, given that I work an off-farm job, if I start out working on three acres of corn, in a matter of a few days, I can do it. So I get that sense of accomplishment, it keeps me going, and I usually don't need more than that. Um, it works perfect for the rotations, and which is very helpful. And m us being grass-based, obviously rice land meadows, we, um, we raise our beef and lamb and everything on, on grass. The horses are on grass, um, and so having the paddocks rotated it provides the protein needs and everything we need including pastures because I work an off-farm job and because I'm getting older though I, I don't necessarily like to admit that the more I can do that the animals take care of themselves the easier it is for me so that being said hogs and they're on self feeders self waters uh, every paddock here, every I should say every other paddock has a hydrant. So no matter which paddock the animals are in, I can turn the water on, fill a water trough. I don't use floats, and I, I guess it's just a personal thing because 
horses, cattle, they tip the waters over, so then I'd be at work and there'd be 12 hours that the thing would be running. So I'm sure there's better waterers, um, but I like to go around every single day, check on every animal, know they're okay, check the water, fill it as needed, and um, having the water system, the water lines helps. I mean, I, it just it's just a good fit. So that's an efficiency. This pond that uh, it's, I'm looking at, it's kind of behind the camera, but it was put here when we moved in. It did two things. It got rid of a low area that was here that I farmed around for a few years, and it collects all the rainwater off the buildings. So one of the things we did was we put this pond in when we first came here to get rid of a wet spot that I had farmed around, and also that gave us a, a tremendous amount of dirt, uh, clay dirt, to make pads for the buildings and also the topsoil, but it got rid of a wet area and I use it to collect the water off the roof to fill the pond. And this pond waters all the animals and all the uh, upper pastures, if you will. <clears throat> we um, brought the, the water comes off the roof in two places. The back part of the roof comes uh, in a tile behind you and this one comes off the front of the house and across the yard because this is a real wet spot too. So I ran the perforated tile through the wet spot and into the um, pond. So I not only collect the rainwater, I collect any water that would have been otherwise just sitting here. So it drains the land a little bit where we have to mow, but it also, it's all filtered. And if you, you can see good from above or from far off, the pond actually sits up in the air. So I don't get any runoff into the pond other than what we put in there, um, which I think is a very good thing. <clears throat> uh, this is end of October, so we've used the pond all year to water everybody, and we're down about probably two feet from normal. Uh, when the pond's full, it's about eight foot deep, so there's 600,000 gallons of water here at any given time. Um, for livestock or irrigation. Um, all the hydrants you see come from this pond. So I can water the fruit trees, I can water our garden, and obviously the livestock. The middle of the pond, that is the filter and the suction for the pump. I just have a shallow well jet pump in my basement. So it pulls the water into the basement and then out to the hydrants. And the reason I did that was so if the horses knock the hydrant over or if something breaks and freezes, if the pump keeps running in the basement, I know there's a problem somewhere. And if it's the middle of the night, I can just go down and shut it off. If it's during the daytime, then I know, oh, I left the water running. <laughs> and that has happened. <clears throat> Do you have a well as well? We have city water here that comes from Lake Erie for the house. Um, my wife was a city girl and she preferred that. Um, but we could have drilled a well here. We just didn't. It was, the, the price was the same, and so we went with the city water. <clears throat> Part of the layout had to do with the closeness, proximity for doing chores, but also each building has to have a, a little bit of function with it. The horse barn, if you notice the cupola, I needed a place for my weather vane because I, I just enjoy that. <laughs> but that's very functional. That is my foul air. So the hay comes up, I'm sorry, the bad air comes up the hay ladder and out it, that's all vented. So I thought that I'd have to use a sliding door to slow the flow down or speed it up but it works out that if I leave it wide open, it's a perfect mix, so I get the barn stays clean and, and it works real good. The cupola on this barn um, is I used it for natural light, so I get a little extra light in there. It's also vented, helps keep it cool. Um, this barn is mostly uh, my horse-drawn machinery storage. It's up here close where I can hook onto something and then go get the other equipment. Um, and some of the pieces, if I'm working on something or whatever, I keep it here where it's close and easy. The east end of that barn, I'm, the whole thing's going to become my blacksmith shop, which has been a passion of mine for 20 years, but I never acted on it because too many things going on. So by next year, we'll be forging in there. Um, the pig barn also faces the south and plenty of light, and you can feel the breeze that we have here right now. Well, it stays all summer, so I can. The, there's Dutch doors on the ends. I can open the front windows, open the Dutch doors, and if there's pigs in there, it's calm, it's quiet. It's cool and it's um, ventilated so it's not hard on anyone's nose. Now that being said, I clean pig barns every other day. Uh, pigs are a very clean animal. I compost their manure. 
we live this close to our buildings and we don't want to smell it um, and I don't want to lose the nutrients so if, you, if you're smelling it you're losing nitrogen we don't like that to happen why wouldn't you just have one big barn with everything in the one barn um, th there's a lot to be said for that but that increases the amount of chores because everything's confined and tight and then it comes down to economics uh, at the time I didn't have the money to build one big barn and set it up it would be a wonderful thing um, it's not that I couldn't have borrowed the money I just didn't want the debt so we built the horse barn first we built the pig barn was only uh, three stalls and we have since added on to that to where it is now and we I can show you inside there later uh, same with this building. We knew we needed a place to store our stuff, so this was the first structure on the place was this barn. Uh, the house followed and then the horse barn. Um, and, you know, you'll look around. We have another big machinery barn in the back, uh, and, and that's by design, too. It's out there. To, all the other equipment storage is inside. And it goes back to what I said about, you know, finding farm equipment um, takes a little time. And for a small farmer, the best thing you can do is take good care of that equipment. So keeping it inside is huge, especially where it snows a good six, seven months out of the year. <laughs> Joe, a another one of the things that we worked on when we came here as far as uh, making the farm, it has to be self-sufficient for us. So part of that is a big garden. And when my boys were younger, this garden uh, is about 100 by 50. We planted the whole thing. As the kids leave home, we don't need this much garden. So. If you'll notice, I have part of it planted to a cover crop of rye right now, and that's going to be the size of the garden next year, mostly for our potatoes, squash, and corn, because I can cultivate it with the horses that way, still get around good, and those uh, take up the most room. Um, we do have some raised beds that are in <laughs> awful repair at the moment, but it's raspberries, blueberries, asparagus, and rhubarb. Just a little bit of fruit that we like and the children seem to really enjoy picking their own and eating it so we, it makes plenty for us to put in the freezer and still plenty to eat fresh uh, i like the proximity to the barn because obviously the manure pile is close so that worked out and it's also close to the house another hydrant right here for watering or washing the big dirt off the vegetables getting the most off before it goes into the kitchen my wife appreciates that um, we also have two raised beds uh, on that side of the farm, which I'll show you, and the dynamics and how that's helped us out a lot. Do you get deer up into here? No. It, the farm is pretty much fenced. We do see deer in our fields, but they're not an issue here, huh. and definitely not up here. Okay. Uh, the dog runs around too, which makes sure. a difference, but sure. we've, it's not been a problem ever. So you don't really have any mammal <laughs> pests in your garden much at all to worry about? Uh, just horses if the gate gets left okay. open, <laughs> but other than that, no. But not woodchucks or anything like no, that? Raccoons? No, raccoons? None. Because you're not growing corn, uh, sweet corn, I mean. Raccoons can be a problem here because of our proximity to the river and the water. Right. Um, but my son hunts, and we kind of try to manage them as best we can, and I think the dog running loose and leaving his scent makes a big difference. Sure. Uh, if, if we have any problem with raccoons, it's generally in the hen house, and now that we've changed the way we do that, that's better too, and I can explain that when we wander over that direction. You're, you're shrinking the size of the footprint of your garden. What will you do with this space around it? Just mow We're it? We're just going to mow it. Yep. Uh -huh. Keep it clean and it's a place to wipe your shoes. Sure. <laughs> it works out pretty yep. good. Uh -huh. And again, it's, it's all about condensing your time so you can devote more time to the things you need to do or want to do. These your <clears> pumpkins? These are not my pumpkins. You this didn't year, grow pumpkins this year. This year we did not. Right. No, I, I did have a few volunteers at the back of the feedlot, but, but we didn't use them all. <laughs> <clears throat> So Joe, we built these raised beds, um, more for, we didn't, we got tired of picking green beans standing on our head, uh, and strawberries, strawberries were, <laughs> they're tough. So we put the raised beds in, and what we do is we have strawberries in the bed for two years, sometimes three, and then we switch the beds over. So these are, just next year's, these are sure crop berries, and uh, pretty much ready to go into winter. They're actually a little overcrowded, um, uh, but I'm not going to worry about them because these are, we didn't even pick strawberries out of this bed this year. This is just the daughter plants that took off. So when spring comes, we'll take a good look at it and eradicate as needed. Well, and they're fully suppressing any weeds. Yes. Of course, we have a little tiny good. bit. I mean, there, there are a few, but dandelion, you know, you'll see some clover kind of volunteer. But for the most part, they stay pretty weed free and that helps a ton. And you can pick from either side 
And what I discovered this summer when my knee got replaced was I could actually garden out here standing on crutches. So it was mental health for sure. This was where we had our, like what we call our kitchen garden. So we usually have tomatoes, a few peppers, salad greens, garlic. We plant in here. <clears throat> green beans for sure because I can successively plant green beans and we have enough for us and then some all year. Currently it's seeded down to rye. So I worked it all up and then put the rye cover on. And will you green manure this in then, the yes. rye? Yes. Uh -huh. i mow it and then incorporate it. I, I get up on there with a little manis rototiller and incorporate it with that. I used to just do it by hand, but then I decided that's, that's too much work. Sure. We keep a flock of laying hens uh, for us all the time. Uh, right now we have a dozen hens, which is more than keeps us in eggs. The chicken park, the one that's here is roughly 25 by 50, a little more, a little bigger on the end where the chicken house itself is. But if you notice, we even have to mow it a few times a year because the chickens stay in the grass and they don't even keep up with the grass. If we have more chickens, like this house is designed for up to five dozen, I have a hole in the fence and that whole field out there where the sheep are grazing now becomes the chicken yard. So basically they're free range. It goes clear down to the lane and back to the building. Um, but with just a dozen, it's easy to keep them confined. They still are not, you can see they're pretty happy and pretty healthy. Yep, they sure are. The chicken house is one that I designed and then I had a guy build for me because the difference of him building it and me building it was $200 and he could do it in his shop. So if you notice, it's monitor style. And the upper portion, that's a panel, so it lets light in. So all year round, we get plenty of light and plenty of ventilation because each end's vented. Again, it goes back to my, I guess, a, a love for a cupola. Um, you gather the eggs from the outside, so my wife can come out on, when she's doing her morning stuff and gather the chicken eggs without having to go in the chicken Is house. Those bins are on the side there? Yes, right here, <clears throat> this is a there's a lift door. So the hens lay in these little compartments. We keep a ceramic egg in here to entice them to lay in whatever spot. We had to put designs on them because they looked too much like an egg. We kept gathering those little ceramic eggs, but the eggs stay nice and clean this way. We let them go in shavings, you know, lay their eggs in shavings. I mean, gee whiz, they're ready for storage almost. They sure are. And. Uh, do, Again, they, do, do any of them hide them on you? Do they usually find no, them there? No, they're confined. We usually wait till about 10 or 11 in the morning. Everybody's done laying. And over the last several weeks, we've got 12 hens. We've been getting 12 eggs. So it's like a grand slam every day. <laughs> this is the back side of our machinery building. And like I told you about adding an overhang for space, well, the overhang also makes for a corn crib. There's a bin in the center for a grain bin and another corn crib on the other end. I've only filled a crib and a half once. Um, and that's when we have a big sow herd, it takes that much ear corn to get them to the winter. Uh, Cause that's primarily what I use that ear corn for. The horses get a little bit in the winter just to keep them warm and make them feel good, I guess. And the bin storage was what I could afford in the, in the beginning of us coming to this farm. I've since transitioned to more uh, easier bins. So I have a poly and I have a Brock bin. And the but bins are for the spelt? For the spelt, for oats, uh, you could use shell corn. Do you use shell corn or do you do mostly ear corn? Mostly, I, I do all ear all corn ear here, corn. Okay. and that's how I feed it, is on the cob. Okay. The, the sows have no trouble chewing it. When pigs get to be 150 pounds, they get a shovel full a day. More to keep them busy, give them something to do. Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance. You don't want to fill a pig's stomach up with a lot of bulky food on one that you're pushing hard to, to finish. The sows, on the other hand, you want them to be full, so they get a lot more vegetables and that kind of stuff and of course access to pasture um, it's just a perfect way to raise pigs no question about it pig barn is here is uh, also it's 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 in this location for two reasons close to the crib so when you're walking back and forth you're close to the grain source uh, it's also uh, access to the feedlot because when the pigs are not on the pasture i still want them to have a little bit of recess every day I think it helps a lot with muscle development, and you're eating meat, you're eating muscle, so you want to, you want to develop that. But also because it gets the wind, so the, the pig barn stays cooler, comfortable, pigs can't sweat, 
So making them comfortable is a, is a really good thing. And a lot of times the baby pigs are in here, so <clears throat> I train them to go in and out twice a day. And then when it's time to go to market, I just back my trailer up to that little loading chute. The pigs run outside and run right in the trailer. So there's no stress for them. There's no, they're just used to being moved. So that being said, when I want to take them out back, I just open the gates and shut gates and so forth. And pigs go. They know that wherever I'm going, that's, that's a good thing usually coming. So it, I guess it's a trust issue. So, so this building, Joe, is our confinement building, if you will. And, and like I said, you'll notice there's no pigs in here right now. Um, that's because the majority of them went to freezer camp and the sows are farmed out for right now just because of a temporary situation with my knee. Um, but each, each one of these gates opens toward the feedlot. And um, this was a luxury, not necessarily a necessity, but after 20 years we got custom-made gates. Uh, a friend of mine who does our farm and field work, this was a winter project for him, so the gates were inexpensive and should last me the rest of my time here. Um, they're very functional. The little pigs can't get through them, and I just put a 4x4 four four <laughs> underneath the bottom for the first couple weeks, and then, then they're good. Um, this pen in particular is for my whatever sow is gestating. We don't use farrowing crates. My pigs farrow in these stalls. This is an 8x8 eight eight stall. It's plenty big enough for one mother pig. So this is my primary farrowing stall. And like I said, the mom's farrow in this stall. She'll make a nest of straw and whatever she wants. It's up to her. They have their babies in here. And I open this board. It's very simple, very crazy design. I'm buying just some eye bolts with a piece of gas pipe that holds it up. But I open that up and I put a heat light on this side, which you can see the heat light hanging there. It's, I apologize for the cobwebs, but so there's heat light over there, there's straw over there. So as the babies are born, sometimes they'll migrate to the heat light, sometimes they stay with mom, it's their choice. But this stays open the entire time the litter's here. So the babies have a tire swing over here to play with because just like all kids, they need a toy. So they push this around, play with it, and it keeps them from biting each other's tails and gives them something to do. They're also fed over there in a, in a smaller feeder for piglets watered over there so they get everything mom has and everything they want and 16 by 8 feet to run around in and be little pigs um, if i on days that we have to castrate or whatever or warm the little ones then we kind of chase them up there i just pull the pipe <clears throat> that goes down mom's safe in here the babies are safe over there we do what we have to do and then put them back together when it's time to wean same way you just shut the gate um, it's very efficient, it's very inexpensive, and it works very well. We've, I've used this stall now 15 years, and I wouldn't want a pig farm without it. For one thing, when you're castrating little pigs, she doesn't like that. When they start squealing, and the little pigs, I don't think they care about the castration as much as being picked up. Because, um, you know, the girls get it too. But what we do is, we do the castrating or sorting, taking the little girls out. We start lowering over the fence to mom. So then she's fussing with them, and the best thing about that is we use a little bit of blue coat for antiseptic. They all smell like that. So when she gets them all back in a matter of five minutes, she's laying down nursing everybody. Everybody's fine, and the next day... There's too much to talk about in just one episode, so we'll finish up with our discussion of Ralph's farm plan in an episode next month. Ralph has been a frequent contributor to Rural Heritage Magazine. Last year, he combined over 60 of his stories and essays into a book called Cultivating Memories. We're proud to include this book in our catalog. Rural Heritage is... This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. RuralHeritage.com